Good morning. My name is Maurice Crespi, Managing Partner of Schindler's Attorneys. Welcome today to another live webinar uh, brought to you by COBRA. COBRA is a pro bono initiative founded by IQ Business, Schindler's Attorneys and Engaged Business Turnaround. The idea behind COBRA is that we created a partnership, a consortium, then invited uh, uh, other businesses to join to assist on a pro bono basis businesses in distress. Uh, we now have over 50 partners who've joined and have committed to assisting. Uh, the idea is that we provide free advice by way of Zooms, mediation in relation to any uh, creditors or debtors of yours. Uh, we provide a knowledge base in relation to all information that is relevant to the current state of affairs. Uh, that can be found on our website. We are told it is the best and most comprehensive in the country. The website's www.cobra.org.za or you can send us an email at info at cobra.org.za. As part and parcel of our offering, we uh, present and provide these webinars by industry experts on specific topics. We also deal with business uh, rescue in general. Um, we do that once a week. We'll be doing that on Monday. Uh, so please, please join us then. Uh, we also have uh, uh, another exciting webinar tomorrow that we'd invite you to, and that is, is, is How to Present Online by Richard Mulholland, uh, which should be interesting. But today, as I said, one of our partners um, in the COBRA Consortium is IQ Business. And today we have a full house of uh, industry experts from IQ Business who will be presenting today on human-centered design and digital innovation, cutting through the noise. What should you be focusing on during COVID-19? The IQ business panelists, uh, starting with Kerry Thomas. Kerry is the head of customer experience at IQ business and is an accredited customer experience champion and coach. She has a passion for uh, customer um, uh, empowering clients and businesses uh, to make focused changes from their strategy to day-to-day -day workings. Kerry has accredited, uh, has accredited and coached others in methodologies and toolkits with the objective uh, to simultaneously meet customer outcomes and business objectives relating to operational efficiency, cost reduction, and increased revenue. We're also joined by Raf Rodriguez, who is an associate partner at IQ Business, who drives their digital offering. He's in his, uh, he's, uh, he leads the, the digital so, uh, offering. He has a technology background and a passion for great outcomes. We have Gerrit van der Velt. Gerrit van der Velt is a multidisciplinary consultant at, at IQ Business. He has a pas passion for innovation and entrepreneurship and leads the innovation capability within IQ Business, focusing on innovation skills development and the facilitation of innovation campaigns and workshops internally and with clients. So I'm gonna hand over to you guys. Thanks so much for joining. Before I hand over, let me introduce the remaining panelists. Uh, also from COBRA, we have Rene Klopper. She too is from IQ Business. We have Emma Marseille from IQ Business. And we have Gary Barokovitz, who like me is from Schindler's Attorneys. Let me hand over to you guys. Thanks so much for being here today. Fantastic. Thank you, Maurice. I'm going to share the screen. Let me know when it's up, please. All good. Fantastic. Thank you. So I guess um, in terms of introductions, I think, Maurice, you've, you've done that. We, we're here to talk about human-centered design, digital innovation, and see how that might help. Um, in these times, and I, and I guess um, let's jump straight in. Uh, in terms of the, we want to take you through a couple of themes that we believe are really of impacting the digital landscape. Um, aside from the obvious at the moment, in, in terms of the current pandemic, um, and so the first, in our view, is, is obviously technology change. Um, more specifically, the accelerating pace of technology progress that um, you would have heard of and seen a lot about, and, and I guess everybody's seen. The graph that shows how um, 
how things changed in the last century and how most of that change impacts us in the last couple of years. I think um, it's Bill Gates who said we, we typically um, overestimate the amount of change that we can have in two years and we and completely underestimate the amount of change in 10. Um, and I think that's pretty true, but you know, Jeff Moore who kind of predicted that the computing power would roughly double uh, within two years at the same time as, as the cost for that computing power would roughly halve um, was pretty, pretty spot on. And he kind of did predictions over a decade that he'd been right for um, what, what seems to be the, the last half century. So this isn't new. I mean, technology impacting us um, and, uh, and advancing us in terms of moving us to new agents isn't new. I mean, since fire and, and the wheel, if you like, um, technology has managed to usher humanity into new ages. And in general, that was based on machines' ability to process instruction or to process information. Um, I think today, what's different is that we've reached a tipping point um, in terms of computing power. Um, pre predominantly, if you think about it, the, po the pocket power of computers today, so what's possible with a smartphone, um, far outstrips what was possible a couple of years ago with a room full of technology. Um, so I think the two outliers, though, in terms of constraints around technology acceleration, in our view, is digital literacy and data costs. Because the same way as kind of battery power did for ele electricity, what the internet is doing for humanity now in terms of connecting us to this technology and connecting us to the place where most of the innovation can happen, um, there's an assumption that you have the digital literacy and the, uh, you're able to afford the data to connect and to use the internet efficiently. So I, I think um, possibly if there's two causes to fight today in terms of making sure that we can make the best of the technology change, those are around how we can help with digital literacy in general in our country, um, and also really just to continue the, the push to drive data costs down. Um, I was interested to read a study that was done recently, well, 2017 actually, um, at at a, a convention that was around the advocacy of data as a human right for individuals. And they found that um, a study was done to say that if the world spent um, less than 0.1% of what they spend on war today, we could connect every human being on the planet um, and give them enough to cover their data costs. And uh, that's quite, that, that stood out to me that um, as humanity, we, we kind of spending, what we're spending on war, if we took a fraction of that, we could sort out the data connectivity issue. Um, in South Africa, I guess we're dealing with our own data cost um, conundrum in that we, we're probably uh, about halfway, halfway through the scope of what data costs in the world. We're not the most expensive, but we certainly are the most expensive in Africa. Um, and I think one of the problems is that the cost per megabyte is highest if you buy, uh, for those who can't afford to buy in bulk. So although our data costs are fairly low in terms of buying bulk for businesses, when it comes to um, the country in general, it, it, uh, the highest cost is for those who probably need it the most these days. So I guess that's the first theme is around you know, technology change and how today there is a, a bit of a perfect storm um, with, with cloud computing, with uh, data costs in general coming down, um, with the uh, penetration of, of people connected to the internet globally and even in South Africa being fairly high. It does mean that there is a perfect storm, there is the opportunity to to really capture what technology can do for us today. So that's the first theme. Um, and I'll hand over to Kerry just to talk us through what we believe the second theme is, um, and maybe just to kick that off in terms of how technology gets used to reach lots of people. Um, there's an, an interesting uh, graphic over here that shows how the telephone took over 75 years to reach 50 million active users, if you like, um, where a Chewbacca mom product review on Facebook uh, the, the same in just under 24 hours. So access to t technology being prolific means you're able to reach more people a lot more quickly than normal. Kerry? So with customer expectation being our second theme, it links quite well into the tech change as well. Is that our, our customers' demands are changing over time, the expectations are changing over time, and it's how we equip ourselves to think ahead and plan ahead and stay relevant. So I think, you know, as Raf said, during this time, um, COVID has accelerated customer demand, uh, you know, more now than ever. 
Um, and I love this quote uh, by Roy Williams, the first step in exceeding customer expectations is to know what these expectations are in the first place. And I think sometimes that's where um, some organizations have a little bit of a pitfall there is that customer expectations are, are set by yourselves as the companies, uh, by your brand promise, by competitors. But do you know what those expectations are and how do you sort of keep up um, with the trends and being that step ahead? So customers expect organizations to say, you know, what, they, what they're going to do. Um, it's important to, to treat your customers fairly and to understand their needs and their expectations and to deliver what customers believe that they are buying. Um, so the customer expectation is just changing over time um, as with the tech change at the same time. So we think that customer expectation is a really important theme for us to focus on here around being customer centric and customer needs led. Changes in human behavior and ultimately expectations require us to really shift our business models and the way that um, we engage with our customers. So I think that leads us quite nicely into our third team, uh, theme. Thanks, Gerard. Thanks, Kerry. So the, the third theme um, that I wanted to talk about was just the, the multitude of different innovation approaches that uh, organizations and businesses um, have been using um, over the last while. Some of these approaches, and you can see that uh, on the slide, there's, there's so many and they're looking at different ways of, of approaching problem solving and innovating in the business landscape. Some of these have been around for, for many, many years uh, throughout the, the industrial age. And, and we've seen um, as growth um, in the, the different ones coming out uh, in the last few years as well. I think many of these uh, you would recognize like uh, Lean Startup, uh, the Business Model Canvas, and uh, things like Design Thinking that's, that's actually been there for a while, but has sort of re-emerged as well as an approach to, to solving problems in, in business and, and for, for customers. And uh, I think one of the points I wanted to make was that um, Lots of these have, have many different uh, sort of principles and, and value inside them, but it's often difficult to find the right one that, that fits the, the problem and, and the organization that, uh, that you're working in. So I think part of what we do as well is, is to find the right one. Um, there is, there's the right one for the right problem and, and for the, the culture and the organization as well. They're, they're not all suited to to um, every business. Raf. Fantastic, thanks. Thanks, Kieran, Sarah. So I guess um, uh, one of the big problems is that all of this is coming to a head uh, today and these days. And um, COVID has really just accelerated. If, if, we, if we picture these as waves of change, um, all that COVID's really done is, is pushed that wave up and, and made the tsunami coming at all of us a little bit higher and a little bit scarier and a little bit faster. Um, but I guess the job we have to do is to, is to help keep our clients relevant and in, in turn, they help them serve their customers through this because everybody's finding themselves in these situations, um, the market at large. So I guess we'd like to share a little bit around how we think that's uh, possible. Um, so jump in, guys, as we go through this, um, Kevin and Sarah and, and Maurice, just to um, mm -hmm. chat through some of the concepts. But I think we're saying that design, ultimately at its core, is something that's, that's worth focusing on now. Um, and I mean, why design? After all, design is just planning before executing. It's just you know drawing the picture before building the real thing. Um, how is that important enough? I think there's a couple of reasons, and, and one of them is that today design is defined through a number of different lenses. You know, the lens of aesthetics, making something look nice. The lens of accessibility, making sure that you design something in a way that people can access it. Um, and even within that that sphere, there's accessibility around disabilities and for example, color blindness, um, difficulty seeing, difficulty hearing. So design is, is incorporating thinking around how you make sure a product, a service, an experience is relevant and accessible um, for everybody. There's also then design through the lens of architecture. How do you structure um, a service or a process or a product so that it will be effective? How do you lay things out? And I guess that's why it's so important is that um, I think, you know, in I've certainly seen that in our business, we kind of, almost overreacting to what nature is throwing at us now. And so if you start to do things too quickly um, without thinking through the design and without thinking through how, to fit, how your design will be accessible, you sometimes find yourself quite far down the wrong road, uh, certainly with 
the rapid ability these days to develop them. Um, so design is there to give you um, great direction up front. Um, design helps you save money. <clears throat> if you start to explore alternatives while it's still in the design phase of a new product service or an innovation that you're busy with, um, it's a lot cheaper to make changes while it's on paper, or while it's in a, a wireframe, or while it's not lines and lines of code on multiple servers that's already being rolled out. Um, and so there's a balance, I guess, to, to look at between that. Um, and I think most importantly, design-centric businesses have been proven to be outperforming their competitors. You know, there's been research done over eons, but companies that spend time to understand their customer needs better um, and to kind of reframe complex problems in, in the lens of their customers and how they're experiencing it, um, typically will find in, you know, insights that help them to innovate effectively. So that's why we believe design kind of is the, the, the answer to um, making decisions and, and developing services to innovate in any situation, and no matter what size organization you are. Um, just to, I guess, make a point around getting good direction up front is that these days it's possible to develop prototypes in a matter of hours that you can put in front of people to test. Um, and within weeks, um, you can build software and launch that to market. So that implies a fairly high investment profile if you have an agile team developing what you believe will be useful. It's worth spending a little bit of time testing that while it's in the design phase. Um, and I guess that's, uh, that's what we do every day. Um, you know, so our team is essentially made up of creative business technologists, people that can pull together a view of what would work, what would be desirable for a, uh, for a market um, through, through research, through user, user interviews, through observations, um, what would be feasible from a technology point of view, and is this viable from a business point of view. So um, I don't want to spend too much time on what we do, but I guess the point we want to make is this is our world and we, we have to cut through this noise almost daily. Um, when clients have ideas that they'd like to pursue, we often have to ask why. We often have to pull it back to what is the problem that they're trying to solve. And so we kind of feel that that's the type of advice to, to share the most broadly. is Before you fall in love with your solution, um, stay in hate of the problem that you're trying to solve. And I think the potential here is some more of that from Rich tomorrow. Um, he does amazing um, talks and it's, it's horrible, Maurice, to have to precede him because he's going to probably describe a few things that we do wrong <laughs> in terms of online presenting. But um, I, I remember a talk that he had that, that really stuck with me around stay in hate of the problem you're trying to solve as opposed to in love with your idea or the solution. Um, I guess we, th this slide says that too, is we, we use approaches like design thinking to make sure we explore the problem to, to its nth degree. We use approaches like lean to make sure we're building the right things. And when we say the right things, we don't just mean based on an opinion, but based on exploring iteratively with the market as you build a product is tested um, and get feedback and learn and, and pivot long before you get the actual agile software development team into play or the team that's going to need to build the product if it's a physical one. Um, and finally, be agile in the way that you actually develop it so that you are building it properly. Um, the days of spending all this time designing and then handing over a bunch of documents to a team of people who are going to craft and build what it is. The context you lose there as opposed to working together continually to, to grow what you're developing um, iteratively and to test that often again as it, as it now becomes real in the market is really important as well. Um, and ultimately, if you do this, you'll, you'll, you'll find ways to take friction out of experiences that, um, that you're developing for your clients because you'll detect them long before you spend um, a fortune to build the product and then, and then have to defend it as opposed to pivot it. So I think just to pause there, um, we wanted to maybe talk a little bit more through those three, those three concepts and then share a, a couple of success stories and then one or two gems that we believe would, would help um, during these times. So Kerry, if you want to just talk us through the CX framework. Um. Thanks, Raf. Sure. So from a customer-centric perspective, uh, becoming customer centric as an organization really is a journey. Uh, it's a transformation that takes a while to get to, but you've got to start somewhere. So we've spoken a little bit around uh, design and, and human centered design and your customer being at the center of what you do. Um, so in the circle that you see on the screen on the left, we speak around a mature CX, which is customer experience design framework. And we believe that your customer has to be present or top of mind, um, it could be your customer, your user, your stakeholder, um, who's benefiting from the, the service or the product. They have to be 
top of mind and all of these different facets that you see in the circle there. So when it comes to creating a strategy for your organization, um, have you got customer centricity as a pillar as part of your strategy? Um, do you have the customer present in your strategy at all? We spoke a little bit around design and designing for the right reasons and doing the right thing and um, looking at it from a lean and agile design thinking perspective. Um, when you're looking at design, who are you designing for? Um, who are those customer types? It's not just one size fits all. Um, looking at having, when you're implementing, having um, a customer focus in terms of how you're implementing, whatever it is, how you're tracking improvements, how you're measuring it. So your customer should be present in all of those facets there, where you develop your vision, um, where you design and prototype and roll it out, and then the way in which you measure it. So we help clients along their journey at any one of these um, little chevrons in the circle there, whether it's from the strategic um, perspective of putting the customer first through to their design. And it really is about understanding what it is you're trying to achieve, what is that vision, and is it customer led? Um, are you designing for the right reasons? And, and then how you implement it from there. So our holistic framework is around um, trying our best to achieve maturity in all of these different circles over there, the different chevrons in the circle, um, to be customer led. So it's understanding who you're designing for, why you're doing it in the first place, which links in quite nicely to what Beth and Kerat are going to take us through around, um, understanding the context, why you're doing it, what the problem is you're trying to solve for and what you're designing for in the first place. So I think it leads quite nicely into our design thinking and innovation. Thanks, Kerat. Thanks, Kiri. So an approach that we use um, as well uh, in a lot of the work that we do is, is design thinking. And, and we found it very useful in, in its way that it structures the, um, the design process. Um, picking up on what, what Raf said earlier about design not, not only being about the, um, about the solution and, and, and crafting that, but also understanding the, the problem. Um, design thinking helps us do that. And it's, we, we often, um, clients approach us uh, with a clear solution that they've got in mind uh, and, and need us to, to help them implement that. Um, we often take, take a step back and help them make sure that it's the right, right solution that's, uh, that needs to be implemented. So design thinking, we allows us to, to take a step back um, go back to uh, to the customer, as Kerry spoke about, really walk in their shoes and understand their perspective um, and really get really key insights from that um, that experience to then hone in on a particular problem that, that needs solving. And it, it may not be the problem that was originally envisaged, but um, or it may be a nuanced one of that, but you have a lot more information to work with. And once you know that, you can start um, ideating and crafting a solution that speaks to, to the real problem. Um, importantly, once you've, you've created a solution and you have something in mind, it's about validating that and going back to your customer and understanding whether what you think may be a solution, whether that's, that's actually truly so. All right. Thanks, Gerard. And, and we've seen this in action. We recently ran um, an innovation hackathon within IQ Business and uh, up front where, where you see this double diamond kind of diverging. Uh, there, were, there were so many ideas that, that came through from, from the so kind of six, seven hundred people that were initially participating. Um, so that, that idea of, of understanding the problem and then having lots of ideas to work through um, was really exciting to see in practice uh, in our own business. And the process of then back, defining them back down to a, a set that kind of meets the objective of solving the problem um, is also really interesting to, to work through. Um, on the kind of design side, um, we've got a, a number of different ways that we do this too. Uh, essentially, if a client hasn't got a design process that, that's familiar to them or that they, that's mature, we help them really just put a three-step process together, which is help decide on whether something is feasible, viable, and desirable which is often through the design thinking led process. Um, we help them then design for success. Um, and that's in the form of either user interface design, visual design, a combination of solution design and technology design. Um, and then we help them to succeed in terms of staying in the game um, for whoever develops 
the innovation. Um, you know, it's not always the case that we get a project that is concept to success, that our team um, work in isolation. I think one of the key things in design is being able to work with other parties and being able to work with the specialists in their field, no matter who is building um, the innovation. Um, and then um, I, th I think it's, it's so many times that we've seen a, a really great idea be um, unsuccessful. And sometimes that happens just because of the disconnect between who's deciding it's worthwhile, who's designing it, and then who's building it, being in different silos. So as difficult as it is to collaborate across something that you're passionate about, um, I think that's the trick to get right here is, is stay in the room with the people that are building your product and your innovation and make sure that they are talking to each other so there isn't a handover of information between phases because that's very, very old school and it's very, uh, it's proven to be unsuccessful. There's too many finger pointing exercises that happen when something goes wrong. The idea was always a great idea. The design was always done properly and the development was always done well. So why are things not working? I guess it's because you've got three different groups of people telling you those stories as opposed to having one team co-create something and, and sticking with it. Um, and who, again, stay in so, so much focused on the problem they're trying to solve that they're not willing to defend the solution until it's successful. Um, so I guess just some, some examples of where we've, we've done this and, and maybe they make it a bit more real. Um, we, had, we, had, we had a client in the UK who uh, was a challenger bank and they were looking to improve the process that their brokers go through when they're trying to sign up clients to a mortgage. Um, and they're also trying to increase the speed at which and the turnaround at which they're able to approve mortgages. Um, and so the steer initially from the client was a lot about having a look at what the big banks were doing globally and looking at the technology and starting with the technology first and saying, here's what's possible. So let's get a platform and then let's try and mesh that to our solution. And we, we convinced them to spend some time doing what's called a discovery sprint, which is a little bit of research around the desirability, feasibility, viability. And so the research we were able to do really brought a couple of things to life. But, but two that I want to highlight is that their third party brokers were servicing multiple banks. And so they would often decide which bank to approach for mortgages based on the frictionless nature of their process. Um, and there were other factors, but in this particular example, this challenger bank was looking for uh, property development primarily. So a surprise as we were to find out that the data connectivity in the UK is not as not as good as you might think, especially when it comes to slightly outlying areas. Um, a lot of the property developments were in these outlying areas, and so connectivity wasn't great. Um, and a lot of the platforms that we did take a look at as part of the research relied on an always online model. Um, and so even though these brokers were dealing with other banks, there was this thing called Friday Admin Day, which meant if you spent a successful week selling um, property development um, housing units to to clients. You've also spent that week collecting all of their physical documentation so that on Friday you could go and upload it into the various bank systems. Um, even if you had a scan and upload type solution, you would typically have to do that work when you got home as a broker. Um, and so, you know, that led to us being able to very quickly pick one or two things to develop in a very short space of time that focused on the real friction points and the real kind of user challenges that were being faced. Um, and when we told the brokers that with what was developed by, for, by the bank, they could skip Friday admin day because as soon as they scanned in documentation from the various clients, the minute that the technology detected there was any form of signal, it would start to share that, those documents with um, our clients. And that typically by the end of the same day, um, just on their drive home or their commute home, this would have all have happened in the background. Um, you can imagine that a lot more applications starting, started to come through to our bank. And the other big plus, I guess, by focusing on the client, uh, on the user problem, um, was that you know they were very happy to skip Friday admin day having to drive back to the office to, to, to catch up a bunch of admin. Um, and by choosing just those two or three things to focus on, we were able to help um, the bank develop this in, in less than eight weeks. So I think this example is just about focusing on what the real problems are as opposed to um, what the status quo is, which I thought was quite useful. Um, here I think this is the design um, sprint. Yes, um, so this was a really interesting um, project we did uh, a while ago for uh, one of the South African banks. And we were able to, to apply um, 
a uh, lot of the design thinking principles in, in the process of, of solving this uh, for the clients. Um, if you have a look on the, the right hand side, the, the three main sort of drivers or principles around those design thinking is um, sort of based around human values, whether, whether customers actually uh, want and need um, a particular solution, whether it's technically feasible and, and whether the business um, can actually, uh, it's of business, benefit of the business. So is it uh, saving costs or is it making money? And, and for, for this bank, um, they had a process, a uh, very manual process with lots of Excel spreadsheets and manual forms that needed to, to be completed. And they had um, an internal area as a customer uh, that needed to receive a lot of the data that they were producing um, through this process. And they wanted to, to have a look and see how we can streamline this process, um, make it more efficient. And, and they budgeted um, actually a quite huge, huge amount of money um, to do this and solve this properly. And, and through the process and approach that we took with them, we were able to, to spend, I think it was about 20 times less than they originally budgeted for, um, to the point where the solution that they had in mind was not really the right solution and it wasn't um, necessarily of benefit. There, there was a much easier way to, to solve the problem for them. And the approach we take um, involved a diverse set of stakeholders. It, it involves uh, the business driving this. It, uh, we involve uh, people from the technology areas, but also um, specifically the downstream uh, customers as well. And by involving all of those people, um, we were able to, to, to understand what, what the issue was and, and how we could solve it differently and, and not go through uh, necessarily diving straight into a technology uh, development that, that would end up costing a huge amount of money for the clients and not really um, solve the, the problem for them. So it was a great, great illustration of, of, of a way where we take a step back and, uh, and really understand why, why something is needed and, and whether the solution is the right one. Right. Kerry. Thanks, Gerard. So this was a piece of work that some of our designers did um, for a pay TV service provider, um, linking CX strategy to your corporate strategy. Um, so this client um, broadcasts um, pay TV uh, for 48 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so over time, over the last couple of years, they've been working on developing their customer-focused uh, strategy, looking at different stages of the customer journey, what the customers go through um, as subscribers, and really focusing on understanding what those steps mean to them, uh, what the experiences are that they go through it and how they could improve it. Um, so this is looking at customer experience strategy, but looking down at a design level like we've been speaking about before. So stepping into the shoes um, of those customers, those different personas that we call them, um, and looking at what they experience through these five specific stages of their journey when engaging with um, this provider. Um, so what they wanted to do was look at existing information, existing data. I think, you know, many companies have so much client data at the fingertips but don't quite know what to do with it um, and this was a great example of how they used existing customer data and insights around their customers um, to find ways in which to improve the different stages of the journey and um, they reviewed user requirements so different types of personas or customer types um, who would go through these different stages and ultimately assist them in creating a strategy for each one of those phases, sort of a, an action plan as to how they could best um, engage with their customers along that journey. So um, together with um, our experience in research and customer insights and design, we were able to formulate strategies at each of these stages of the journey for the user that both meets the needs of that customer and the needs of the business. So often it's quite difficult to sort of weigh up the business outcomes and the customer outcomes. Um, but through our approach, we find ways in which to really balance that quite nicely. At the end of the day, you've got to have customers to keep the business going, but you've got to keep the business going at the same time. 
So how do you do that? And it's about really just balancing those outcomes. So we help this client um, along their, their CX journey to deliver financial results and align the operational efforts um, as well as meeting the CX targets and, and making sure they were delivering on the right outcomes for the customers, the different parts of their journey. Thanks. So, I mean, I think you can hear and see the passion, um, but we want to kind of make this a bit more practical. Um, so we've got three gems that we believe are useful, no matter the situation you're in, the size of your business, and what you might be focusing on that we'd like to share with you. And then we have some free goodies that we also believe could help. Um, and so we'd, we'd like to make um, that available to all the attendees of the webinar over the next couple of months. So let's jump in. Um, I think the first thing at a principal level in design um, that I, I kind of would like to share is that design without context is just decoration. Um, and this, this is a bit of a mashed up quote between two existing quotes. So Jeffrey Zeldman, who kind of founded Web Design Standards um, and a couple of other important um, things of our time, uh, said that design without content is just decoration. And what he meant there was he was tired of seeing all these designs with ipsum lorem everywhere that look beautiful when you're using Latin placeholder text to show a customer how it might look. But often the content, the importance of the content that's going to be presented in the design is really um, misunderstood. And so it looks great on paper. And the minute you try and put the real content in, everything breaks. The layout breaks. That incise things properly. So um, that's the first quote. The second one is that content without context is dead. And this is a great blog um, that I spent a bit of time on just understanding how to link the two because, um, you know, content comes in many forms. It, it could be wordy, it could be, um, you know, bite sized chunks. And I think understanding the context in which your user is going to use that uh, information really, really helps you to design your content strategy and how much information you should be sharing and whether it should be more one-directional or bi-directional. And I think the, the graphic here really sums it up, is that you know, if you think about the Uber app, there's, there's three, two, two main stakeholders, your driver and your rider. Um, and so if the designer sat in their office and designed a, a really nice-looking interface, that's great. But if they hadn't thought about the context in which um, that technology was going to be used by the driver in terms of having to drive and, and uh, interact with the screen while moving and, and keep that safe, and a rider who might be in an area that um, is, is open and might be dark and you know, not have good visibility. All of that context around the technologies they're going to use, who they're with at the time, um, is really important to finalize a design. And the earlier you start to spend time understanding that, the better. Um, and this doesn't mean that, we, that we're saying aesthetics is not important. In fact, there's a law in UX that says, it's called the aesthetic usability effect, um, which is actually just the law of attraction is that people are drawn to beauty and that we also believe that if something looks better, it's likely to work better. And I think Apple, Apple have capitalized on this. Their product might have technically fewer features, but um, because they've spent time making it look really good, people are a lot more tolerant around, um, around that fact. So that's, uh, I think, design is tapping into human nature really well. To build off what Raph's speaking about here with the Uber example, um, I love this quote by Steve Jobs. Got to start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology, not the other way around. And I think um, many people have made the mistake of coming up with some awesome tech, some awesome product and getting so excited about the solution without thinking around what are we solving for in the first place? What is this? What is the problem that we're solving for? Um, and who are we solving for? How do we know what matters to our customers? And um, how do you know if you're designing for the right reason? So I really, really love this quote. And you think about uh, the Uber example around the fact that Raf said, you've got the driver and you've got the rider. You've got different users and understanding what their needs are um, and then creating that experience, that ideal experience for them and then saying, what is the tech that could support or enable this? So um, the, the real gem here for me is around understanding who you're designing for and meeting that need making it easy for them and then making it enjoyable not making it enjoyable and fun and then going hang on what are we solving for in the first place so it's around understanding your customers and um, putting yourself in the shoes of the customers or the different users so the driver and the rider um, and then really understanding what they go through what are those moments of uh, of, of joy what are those highs what are those lows and um, how could you improve different elements of it uh, bearing in mind who you're designing for in the first place and then making it enjoyable 
um, you've got to find a way in which to, to keep up and stay relevant. So finding a competitive advantage is really around your customer experience these days and not just your product or your service. So around focusing on the customer experience um, and making sure that that's on par before you think about, you know, adding any of the other the bells and whistles to go with it. So that's my gem. So the third gem uh, that I wanted to, to highlight was um, something I came across um, in a documentary I watched about design um, a year or so ago. And uh, they were interviewing uh, Julie Zahn from, from Facebook. And, and she was speaking about what she's learned in the process and in her career at, at Facebook. And, and she was saying that the best results that, that they've achieved was very often not when they were talking about how to solve a problem, but, but talking about the why and why they, they have to solve it. And, and it speaks to, to the journey that Facebook has come from where I think in the early days of Facebook, they, they were all about how to, to create it and uh, how to make it work te technically. And, and the problem these days with Facebook is, is more about um, understanding the various different customer groups, uh, understanding why they, they want to use the platform um, or possibly why, why they're not using it. Um, and I think the background that I've, that I've included there is, speaks about another um, situation with McDonald's where it also applies to where, where they were looking at uh, improving their um, uh, milkshake sales. And it was quite mediocre and they were trying many different ways to, to improve their milkshakes, make it a bit more chocolatey or chunkier. And, and they had um, interviewed many different customers uh, and the customers would tell them exactly what they would want, what they prefer, and, and they would go and change the milkshakes um, to what the, the customers actually um, said they like. And they found that it had absolutely no change in, in the sales for, for the milkshakes. And um, they, they then uh, started looking at uh, just observing and empathizing with, with the, the customers, looking at what's, what's happening. And they... They found that over half of the milkshakes that were sold was, was sold before eight o'clock in the morning by people that come in by themselves and um, get in the car and, and drive off. And they found it perplexing and so they started talking to those customers and understood why, why are they doing this and, and uh, what, what they do with the milkshake afterwards. And they found that it's they often have a very long commute and uh, they needed something to told while they, they're driving and the the customers often knew that they, while they're not immediately hungry it's it's late in the morning that they know they'll certainly be hungry by the time they get to work and milkshakes helps to um, helps with that and, and i think that's that's also why it's it's understanding why the customers came in to buy that milkshake um and it was not necessarily whether it was chocolatey or uh, whether it was chunky, but, but it's for the need of, of that commute. And uh, by understanding that, they were able to make a real difference in how they sell it, how they promote it as well to the customers. If you meet it. Thank you. Uh, so thank you. I think that's what we wanted to share with you. Other than uh, you know these these last bits, is we, we feel quite passionate that um, if you spend time understanding user experience, customer experience, and innovation in a little more detail where needed, that it'll make a difference to your to your ability to innovate and to be successful. So you know part of what we wanted to kind of close off with is just to make an offer that over the next two months or three months um, we'd we'd like to offer everyone on the webinar. Um, who needs it, um, access to our, our training and to some coaching um, and to some innovation training. So um, there's, a, there's a boot camp next week which has a couple of seats left and anyone from this webinar who registers on our, on our website will get a free seat. Um, and that's open for, for this June boot camp and as, as well for our July boot camp. We can take about 12 to 16 people in a boot camp. Uh, it's run for mornings and it's um, a couple of hours a day. Um, so we'd love to, to offer that. Um, Kerry is looking to offer some CX coaching. 
So they can be used over a period of, of four weeks, you know, an hour or two a week um, between June and August. Um, and Hero is offering some innovation training seats as well between uh, July and August. So I think and on our website, you'll find all the details, but um, in, in the CX case, just send an email to the address you see there, and, and we'd love to be able to help. So thanks, uh, Maurice. I'm, I'm not sure if there's a, a Q&A. There is. The there is. I, I see there are one or two questions. Um, but before we get there, um, I'm intrigued. And I was wondering if we could do a deep dive into the aesthetic usability effect. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned it, but it intrigues me. It sounds like it's a cognitive bias in the sense that um, it completely misleads you by, by seeing that a design um, is aesthetically pleasing. Uh, you think that the quality of the product is, is better, even in the circumstances where it's clearly not. Um, I was wondering, have you guys applied your mind to cultural differences when it comes to design? I mean, how does one trigger that? Because... Aesthetically, something may look pleasing to me, but not to another culture. Absolutely, and it's, um, uh, I guess the, the landscape we have in, in South Africa, um, Maurice, means that we have the, the ability to test that um, and to learn about that daily. We've got a really diverse set of designers, and, and often early on in our workshops, assumptions that don't hold true across different cultures come out really quickly. Um, and I think um, you, you've got to deliberately design for that. There are no rules to answer how to make something um, aesthetically pleasing across people types or cultures. And I think just being open to that is always really, um, really useful. Uh, and I think um, just on the aesthetic usability, I, I think you, you're absolutely right. Uh, as humans, we are we are wired to those type of cognitive, you know, cognitive biases. Um, and so understanding them helps you to to use that to your advantage. And that's where ethics comes comes in because you know if uh, it's why we say that making something look beautiful is not unimportant. It's just it's not good enough because you will be kind of duping your your users. There's a couple of dark patterns in design these days um, where um, psychology is used in a negative way as opposed to a positive way. And I guess um, in our business at least, our values drive us there. If we give a damn or care about the problems that we're solving. Uh, we're, we're able to learn and share what's going to work. And you'll naturally do that because of that first value of care. I think um, it is quite dangerous to, to design or innovate without having spent the time understanding who you are designing for. So, yeah, really, really interesting. Um, yeah, I found something on the Internet. Um, just this is aesthetic usability effect. It reads, uh, aesthetic, aesthetics designs are more effective at fostering positive attitudes than anesthetic designs and make people more tolerant of design problems, which I find particularly interesting. And then just on the cultural uh, aspect, I'll read this to you. Cultural aesthetics for user interface design. It says usability and aesthetics are two important factors for designing user interfaces. Aesthetic tastes differ from culture to culture. Therefore, it's unreasonable to design a single common user interface for anyone to expect it to attract all audiences equally. An idea that is that software may automatically compose personalized interfaces based on the individual cultural backgrounds of its users. There are several different factors defining the user's cultural background, such as the user's first language, religion, and education level, and the form of education and the social or political norms of their culture. All of those factors are very important aspects of defining the cultures of users and influencing the aesthetics, uh, pre the preferences of the users, what, what that's telling us is that you can you would even consider different designs on the same platform um, uh, for different cultures. I mean, that's, yeah. Absolutely. And it's also why um, starting with the visual aspect of the design, so the brand and the colors and the look and the, and the graphics has to happen after understanding that you've designed um, the flows and the, and the layout and the navigation properly. Um, you know, quite often we, show the first iteration of our designs to clients. And um, when we've had uh, more inexperienced designers who want to quite quickly show a brand or the look and feel, that's all that gets discussed over the next um, kind of couple of hours of the workshop. Um, and conversely, when we, when we do it properly and we just bring in you know, black and white diagrams to show the flow, um, the customer often looks like they feel a bit let down 
but quite quickly you're focusing on the right elements of the design um, and understanding your user audience and how, how to best design for them means that when you do bring the visual aspect and the aesthetic aspect to it, you've really, really worked out who's going to be using your product. Um, you've cut down all of the, the need to have multiple designs catering for um, multiple user types because you've, you've worked out the innovation's core, which is who's going to use it and what's the problem you're solving for them. Can I add something in there as well, Raf? So I think um, what's also important with the way in which we design is that we don't design in isolation from, from the users or from the customers. It's really around co-creation. And it's not just a buzzword. It's, it's what we really believe in and what we do. So I think it's, that's a really important point to make is that we do understand, you know, who it is that you're designing for, um, included in all those different cultural elements, which are vital. And I've experienced that myself as well, um, dealing with, um, with funeral claims and ways in which burials occur across different, um, different cultures. And that was an absolute eye opener to me and something so pivotal to include in your design is making sure that you understand the, the environment, the culture and so on before you deep dive and just make assumptions that, you know, one size fits all. So I just wanted to add that bit in there. One point, uh, uh, I think. Uh, uh, sorry, I was going to go to a question. Carrot, carry on. Sure, just, just one small point to, to add to that um, is, is the, the drive towards personalization where um, often we, we can't uh, design everything perfectly up front and, and by allowing some personalization in the product or service, uh, that's delivered, customers can essentially design uh, a product and service to the way they want it. And uh, you give some of that uh, back into their hands to, to personalize it to, to what they want. Great. What advice would you give businesses in distress if they find themselves drowning in the problems during the crisis and maybe losing sight of their customers? You unmute? Oh, sorry. I think um, the best advice is to, um, is to not lose sight of the customer. And I know that might sound flippant, but um, whatever you do in isolation now, um, you're making assumptions that, that, that you really need to be testing. Because you know, it's just, just the thought of where your customer is at the moment. Are they stuck at home? Are they in a queue engaging with your retail uh, shop? Are they wearing a mask? Um, are they... You know, there's a couple of new norms that have come out uh, recently and that are changing constantly. That means the assumptions that we, we may even have of the research we've recently done are almost completely invalidated. So um, if you can't get to where your customer is, find a way to solve that problem first. Uh, because I think, you know, to, to all the points we've made, um, any decisions you make in, in isolation of your customer, the users of your service, your product, your experience, um, are going to be assumptions that someone else is making better if they're, if they're tapping into those, those clients' needs and, and uh, situation at the moment. And it sounds so simple, but just talk to your customers, <laughs> engage with them. Um, remember that, you know, we're all going through um, a bit of a crisis together, some, you know, worse than others. But just being a human and realizing that there's humans behind all of this is just to engage with your customers. Um, and understand exactly what Raf says, where they are, what they're going through, and how you could best enable them um, or reach them. This is great content. Do you have to be in the market to really understand the, 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 the CX needed? There are unmet needs and also new needs that the customer does not know about in the market. How do you address those in Africa and for the African consumer and customer? Have you been to East Africa? So I think that the customers don't always know what they need. And I think that's an obvious one. Um, we've got to, you know, use whatever insights we have um, to best find ways in which to understand where they're at and what is the best thing that we could deliver to them. Yes, there will be unmet needs. There could be new needs that arise depending on different life stages or different circumstances that customers go through. Uh, it's about stepping in their shoes and, you know, trying your best to understand what that is um, in order to meet them. Um, and as you mentioned before, you know, um, from a location perspective or environment or culture, this, the same thing applies. Um, I'm engaging currently with five different African countries for um, an insurance provider to not give away too much. And we haven't been able to apply the same set of needs to every customer type in all five countries. Um, it's around understanding 
enabling really importantly their environment um, and understanding what their needs are based on that and then taking it from there. So it's not, it's not sort of, you know, painting the same paintbrush over every customer type. Um, and there will be needs that, that arise due to different circumstances and different situations. I think COVID has, has taught us a lot of that as well and how we adapt and how, how companies adapt to that. I think, um, Maybe yeah, East just African to, side. carry on. Sorry, just, just a point on the, on the East African side. Um, we, we do some work with um, one of the largest banks there and quite recently have engaged developers and designers to, to help them out. And I think even in that context, the, the first job we did was to enable um, their designers to connect better with the audiences that, um, and, and the users and the, and the clients that they need to engage with there. Um, so by, by making sure that they are at least connecting with, the, with those communities um, firsthand, you know, I think your point about um, do customers always know what they want, sometimes you have to observe what the latent need is as opposed to ask the customer what they want. Um, there's always examples of these, but when Sony was mass producing the, the Walkman, um, they were deciding, you know, mass production means pick a color and then let's mass produce that. So they asked their audience, would you prefer a, a black device or a yellow device? And you know, black gadgets were, were everywhere. So the, their hypotheses were that people would choose yellow because it's different and it stands out. And 80% of the people who responded to the survey said absolutely yellow. Um, but 80% of the same audience that had walked out of that convention or that focus group when there were two boxes to actually physically take one, that same audience picked the black device. So they changed from what they said they would do to what they would actually do. Sometimes you'll only get that, Maurice, by observing what the problem is. And I think, you know, a Apple again is an example. No one described the iPad as a need they had. That was something that um, Steve and his team managed to observe that would work. So I think there is a bit of a balance between, you know, talking to and listening to and asking your, your clients questions and actually understanding them well enough to make um, good assumptions and test them on their behalf. Great. Um, I think that's a wrap for today. We're out of time. I'd like to thank the panelists uh, for being here today and for the insightful presentations. Uh, it was absolutely great. Um, we have further webinars. We have a webinar tomorrow that I mentioned earlier. Uh, please join us for that. It's in relation to how to present online like a pro, and it's by Richard Mulliland. Um, he'll be joining us at 10 o'clock. Uh, so thanks once again. If you require any information, please email us at info at cobra.org.za. Go onto our website. You'll see all our webinars are, are there. Or you can go to the respective partner Facebook pages or their web websites and uh, you'll find further information. So thank you to the panelists. Uh, thank you to the attendees. Thanks for making it and have an absolute great day. Thanks all. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers.